And next up is Per Arne Bjørkum. Uh, he's been with Startoil and Equinor since the 1990s, where he served as chief researcher for exploration uh, during the period of 2000-2006. Uh, since he came back from a dean position at the University of Stavanger in 2011, he's worked on issues related to oil and gas generation and migration. He holds a professor emeritus position in geology at the University of Stavanger. For the last 20 years, Björkum has been teaching courses in theory and history of natural sciences at the university and at NTNU. On a personal note, I have truly enjoyed reading your book, And the Letters Tank Honor, written about <laughs> science history, Per Arne. And now we all look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you. I guess, yeah. Uh, can you see my now? Can you see it? Yeah, we can see it. Great. Thank you very much for a nice uh, introduction. Um, the title of this talk is Timing of Oil Expulsion from Source Rocks and, surprisingly, uh, Revitalization of the Pre-1970 Model. The presentation is based on a manuscript that can be found here. Uh, First, a disclaimer, please read this. So this is me talking, not Equinor. Okay. This presentation is not about underexplored place. Instead, it deals with what I would call underexplored problems within today's model for generation and migration of oil and how the problems can be solved. OK, let's get started. Today's model is based on the Roqueval. It was invented in 1977. And if organic matter is heated, a significant fraction of it is converted to oil, as observed. In many times, no doubt about that. However, uh, and also the, the oil is, is of course uh, expected to be expelled at a certain uh, time in, uh, in the history. And by the 1980s, um, people or organic geochemists agreed uh, that the uh, expulsion take place at 120 to 150 degrees Celsius within the, out of the source rock some 80-90% some, uh, is expelled. That means that today's theory predicts that the source rock TOC must decline by up to 50% uh, within the oil generation and expulsion window, as, as illustrated here. Transformed to the source rock, it means that the TOC or organic carbon should decline like this, let's say reduced to the half. However, data confirming the decline is lacking. I've never been able to, to find that. So to test the model, I asked Eivind Stern in, the, in Equinor to help me to present data from Drogne formation within the oil generation window. And here is what he could produce. Here is the figure. Um, there are some 900 samples from the oil generation window. And you can see there's a quite a lot of spread. But notably, there is no significant decline. The average is around 5% throughout the oil generation window, which means it's hard to, to conclude that oil is being expelled. On the contrary, I'm forced to say that no oil, uh, essentially no oil, appears to have been expelled within the predicted oil window. Uh, however, what about the documented decrease in hydrocarbon, hydrogen to carbon ratio within the oil window? This is documented. If you measure hydrogen to carbon ratio in organic matter, it decreases within the oil generating window, predicted uh, window. So, and, and, and there is no doubt, for many years, I thought that was an independent support for oil expulsion because hydrogen uh, oil is enriched in hydrogen, which means that if, if oil is expelled, the remaining organic matter will be contain less hydrogen. However, 
since the TOC is not reduced, we, at least I, are compelled to conclude that hydrogen is leaving as either, either as hydrogen gas, H2S, or water, uh, as illustrated here. The carbon is constant, the hydrogen is decreasing, so there are these are the options. I'll come back to this later. As we have heard by Paul, biodegradation is an important process according to today's model. But what about, I ask myself, what about the subsurface biodegradation? Is there something there that is kind of weird? Well, according to the, to the model, heavy oil is biodegraded to light oil at temperature less than 70 to 80 degrees, as Paul said. And hydrocarbons with less than 30 carbons are converted to methane and carbon dioxide. It's a quite complicated or advanced science, uh, as uh, Paul has uh, shown. But, and it implies that most of the oil is biodegraded, because two-thirds, uh, two well, roughly 70% of the oil reserves are heavy oil. And this is reserves. If you take in place, it means that roughly or more than 90% of the oil has been degraded by bacteria, which is a, a huge number. However, according to Heed, paper published in Nature in 2003, no bacteria capable of degrading hydrocarbons under in situ conditions have yet been isolated from petroleum reservoirs. That got my attention. As we know, as Einstein also said, it starts with observation and ends with it. Why haven't we seen evidence of bacteria if they are so common? Well, that led me to the pre-1970 model. Actually, I was also influenced by Karl Popper, who said, you cannot really understand a scientific theory without understanding its history. So I started to read his history. And I was amazed by what I could, what I discovered. A summary of the state of the art up to 1969 is stated here, uh, one, one of the statements. The oil forming process takes place early and the initial product, the proto-petroleum, they call it, migrates early from the source bed to a carrier bed or the reservoir rock. Biodegradation was not needed. Oil is expelled in an immature state, in a heavy kind of state. As we will see, that was also a problem I will address later. How can that take place? They also had some empirical support for the early expulsion model. Observations suggest that trap must be in place early in the burial history and prior to 6,000 feet. Hedberg was an advocate for this uh, statement. And actually, since sedimentary structuring was considered favorable, structure that was formed later tends to be barren. So that was a geological uh, observation, facts, kind of, empirical fact. And reservoirs and source beds were in the same strata. So they assumed lateral and short distance migration from local source beds uh, into the different sands. And they also have some chemical characteristics of uh, heavy oil and light oil that is a kind of supported their conclusion and that are in conflict with today's model. For example, I mentioned here just a few in the in the manuscript. There are more. The uranium concentration in heavy oils is up to a thousand times higher than in the light or crude oils. And how can bacteria reintroduce the uranium? Well, I don't know. The same goes for vanadium. It's 100 times more vanadium in heavy oil than in light oil. How can that be reintroduced by bacteria? And probably more surprising, the molecular size in heavy oils are in the up to 400 carbons in the biggest molecules, while the crude oil is mostly here. Why? 
hasn't this fraction been given any attention? I don't know. But if you look at the method that are used by today's model to detect molecules, they use gas chromatograph, which means that you measure molecules that evaporate. And molecules with up to four, 40 carbons, they don't evaporate. More than 40 don't evaporate. So actually, they don't detect these large molecules are undetected because they don't evaporate. And actually this decline may not reflect decline in the composition of C40 or C30. It may be that they evaporate more slowly. I haven't looked into that, but that I suspect that can be the reason. Anyway, these large molecules has been unrecognized uh, within today's model. However, there were some unsolved theoretical problems by 1970. How could the heavy oil get out of the source rock, the viscous, stiff stuff? How could the heavy naphthenic aromatic oil be converted to light paraffinic oil or analkanes without precipitation of significant amounts of pyrobitumen, asphaltene? Up to 50% is precipitating during thermal upgrading of heavy oil in raffin raffineries. So why why it doesn't uh, the, or why are not the reservoirs filled with this bitumen or stuff precipitated stuff? I'll come back to both of these questions. I start with the problem one: migration out of source rock. Momper wrote in 1978: In the last two decades, great strides have been made in determining how oil and gas are generated out of generated. Uh, are generated, yeah, um, yeah, but but the oil expulsion remains a mystery. Sorry. So the expulsion was kind of a mystery. I think that um, this deterred many people from looking into it. I've given it a try, and I can draw from experience from other sciences. Sorry. If you. We know that carbon dioxide is generated from the decomposing organic matter. We know that. And when carbon dioxide gas bubbles are introduced to the oil, as they use in the enhanced oil recovery project, the viscosity of the foamy mixture is significantly reduced. Here is measurements. If you do it at 30 degrees, the viscosity goes from three orders of magnitude to down which or up to three orders of magnitude, which means that the viscosity of the foamy mixture is close to the viscosity of crude oil. So the viscosity problem may not be a big issue. Well, and also when carbon dioxide bubbles are introduced to oil, the volume of the oil might increase by some 30%. Organic matter also increases by a few percent. Here is from an oil, up to 20% increase, up to 80 bar, and then it goes down. The reason at, up to, uh, at pressure higher than 80 bar, carbon dioxide collapses to fluid. So there is no gas anymore. So there's a, a limited pressure range where this can take place. 800 bars, let's say 800 meter burial. And the implications are, Load-bearing organic lamina will expand, leading to horizontal tension or fractures. The overburden is basically, is physically lifted, is lifted really. So here is an example of an organic matter laid down early. As you start to generate gas bubbles like this, the whole thing expands. There is physical force, you can't work against that. Uh, and the organic matter will expand which might introduce horizontal fracture. Why the horizontal uh, is not the time for a, to come into here, but the great thing with horizontal fracture, they do not affect or increase the local rock stress. They just lift over burden. The direction of the oil migration is now controlled by the overburden topography. Because if you say this is the kind of uh, lamina and the fracture is generated here, Go here. It cuts through many fracture, many lamina. That's one thing. But the point here is that the, the overburden load is higher here than here, 
which means that the pressure will be higher here than here, and therefore the oil will migrate to the right. So now it's the paleotopography that is important. And the great thing is, since the organic lamina is sub-horizontal and the fracture is horizontal, a fracture cut through many lamina, each of them will supply the fracture with organic or with petroleum, which can extend through for many meters or tens of hundreds of meters through even through mudstones until they hit a reservoir and the reservoir may be filled up. Problem two, how can naphthenic oil, heavy oil, be converted to light paraffinic oil without precipitation of up to 50% pyrobitum? And as we observed when we, as I told you about this, how can this take place? Well, known since the 1930s, with increasing reservoir temperature and age, the oil quality increased, the hydrogen to carbon ratio increased, which implied hydrogen must be supplied to the oil, meaning this must re somehow receive hydrogen to, to be converted to other carbons or diesel. They call it hydrogenation. This is actually also done in raffineries with no precipitation of pyrobetumen. It takes a couple of gram hydrogen to convert one kilo of this stuff to this. And this is done in a raffinery when I don't want to have asphalt precipitation. Pratt actually saw this interesting stuff, as inter interesting, interesting connection between raffineries and uh, reservoirs. In 1934, he wrote, hydrogenation, like cracking, is a refining process, sorry, which has recently been adapted to commercial uses. What happens to an oil which undergoes hydrogenation is very much like the changes in crude oils as they grow old under natural condition. So here he connected raffineries and, and in reservoir maturation. However, they did not know where the hydrogen could come from, nor did I sample it. Terry told us about uh, a lot of sources, but I'll come back to that. What about the free hydrogen? Well, it wasn't recognized until Hunt's textbook in 1979. He realized that there's a lot of free hydrogen in the subsurface fluid and in many of the gas accumulation also contain significant free hydrogen. The main source for hydrogen is likely to be organic matter in mudstones. They contain 1% TOC, which means that the total amount of organic carbon in subsurface is mainly, most of the organic matter is in the mudstones, not in the source rocks. Uh, from the manuscript, I have, uh, they made a calculation how much hydrogen that can be produced from a mudstone. It, I concluded, this implies that every kilo cubic meter of mudstone might produce five to ten to an enormous amount of, of hydrogen, you can see, and it is enough to convert 1.5 billion barrels of low quality naphthenic oil to high quality paraffinic oil. So you can upgrade the oil. Mudstone appears to be a very important source for hydrogen. However, by the early 1980s, there was no need for in reservoir maturation since the oil was assumed to be expelled in a light paraffinic state at temperature between 120 and 150 degrees. No need for hydrogen, of course, because the oil was ready, was already matured. Regardless, the presence of hydrogen gas in subsurface fluid appears to have been overlooked. Implication of hydrogen gas in subsurface fluids are hydrogen gas affects the thermodynamic of all organic molecules and must be considered as a reactant. Sorry. The rate of conversion to paraffinic crude oil might be controlled by the rate at which hydrogen is supplied to the reservoir oil by diffusion or water flow. But diffusion, really, most of the hydrogen is, uh, is uh, likely to be within the water phase. When it comes to in reservoir maturation, McNabb published a paper on based on global, a global study, 
concluded that 70 degrees appears to be a threshold temperature for generation of light hydrocarbons in reservoirs. This happens to be the same threshold temperature for when bacteria stops working, according to today's model. So, then here's the conclusion. I urge back to basic, keep it simple. But as Einstein said, keep it as simple as possible, but not simpler. So this might be a little bit too simple, but uh, let it be. Look for early structuring and trap formation. Construct overburden topography to determine the direction of, of, of expulsion. Identify source rocks, or that is mudstones with laminated organic matter, it must be laminated, adjacent to reservoirs. If looking for good oil, look for reservoirs that have been subjected to temperature higher than 70 degrees. That was all I have to say. Thank you for your attention. Very interesting. And quite different to uh, the normal theory or prevailing theory of uh, oil windows and yeah. um, temperature ranges and oil maturity um, trends. So um, we have no clear questions uh, unless there is an I'm wondering if part of the answer from Paul Ferrimon is regarding um, your slide on um, the uranium and vanadium concentrations. Okay. Well, I, had a, I had a similar question, so I'm going to attempt yeah. that. Yeah, you, I, I, yeah, I agree. And, uh, my question is, is it really possible, is it possible that the increase in uranium and vanadium concentration is related to possible loss of mass during yeah. the degradation, as Paul was talking about? Yeah, if you do that, then you have to re, have to re, remove some some hundred to thousand times. Uh, if you have thousand liter, you have to to reduce it to one liter. And that is a, a sign. Yeah, you know, it's it's the mass balance doesn't uh, doesn't work out. It's too much up uh, concentration required. You can do it twice, probably ten times, by removing the if that was uh, really taking place. But you can't do it hundred or thousand times. So that's that's the that's the main point here. And this data is not reported. Uh, uh, the problem is if you don't you don't find this data reported in modern literature about this stuff. I had to go back to the old paper before 1970s. So it has been uh, for some reason not uh, paid attention to. I don't know why. Anyway, I think it is incredibly refreshing to have um, people thinking by themselves and coming up with new <laughs> theories. And then we have a but I will, a bit before you before you said I I haven't been thinking so much myself. I've relied on old people's work, like Hedberg. It's not so original as you might think. <laughs> History is important. Yeah. So yeah. we have a question from Thierry Chacun from Geolink. Uh, a source of hydrogen within black shales could be the precipita precipitation of the pyrite. Could this fit? Yeah, but that's right. Uh, yeah, of course. Hydrogen is, and the fact that there are free hydrogen in the subsurface was recognized by the, the Soviet, uh, former Soviet Union people, uh, geologists. Uh, but uh, in the West, we actually tend to ignore it. Yeah, hydrogen is a, is a very important, and, and as Teddy told you, as there are free hydrogen, hydro, hydrogen uh, in, in the subsurface fluid. And you have to consider that when you deal with hydrocarbons, but that is not done today. It, it is no doubt that hydrogen is there as a fact that has not been acknowledged. I don't know why. And then we have a, a final comment from uh, from Rune Mjös. Uh, he says uh, it's good to see that petroleum geology insights gets more focus by honoring all the excellent work by H.D. Hedberg more than 50 years ago. 100 to 300 kilometer long distance migration, which today's PSA model requires, is not at all supported by Hedberg's geotechnical evidences in the Oficina area of Venezuela. And he recommends some reading there. 
Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, there were several hundred reservoirs with different oil composition, uh, uh, depending on, uh, yeah, and, and, and how could you explain that from about 300 kilometer lateral migration? In isolated, it was, it was lens, lens sandstone lenses. So it, it, I would say that the Hedberg paper by 1947 is an example of things that doesn't fit into today's model at all. And it's not referred to. Mm. That's the problem. It's ignored. So I agree with Rune there. Good. You Sounds will be surprised if you read if you read the source book. I had the source book from Dot and Reynolds, 500 pages. If you read that, I'm sure you will not be the same person after that. I was not. I, I trained. I became a very different geologist immediately. <laughs> so good. this is not so much me. Be aware of that. I'm just reconstructing old theories and and some. I had to improve some of the or the, the problems they had, which was easy to kind of thing to do because other scientists have already done it. You just have to connect the dots. Very good, a very interesting talk. Thank you very much, Karana. Yep, yep. And now we're heading for a little coffee break. And if you do have any more questions when you get to think a bit about it, don't hesitate to put it in the chat and Karana can, can try to answer it uh, directly there maybe. Yeah, and you can send it to my mail address in Equinor, P-A-B. Yeah. I, I can be happy to, to answer mm. them. Fantastic. Good. Yep, yep. So then we'll be back at uh, half past uh, two yep. to listen to Axel Wenke. So see you then. Yeah.